I think Travis has uh, performed just a little bit better so far this season than, than uh, Kendall. Overall, when you look at the numbers, it's very close. It's it's no different than when we came out of fall camp uh, with it being a tight race. Uh, Kendall's run the ball a little bit better than Travis has uh, so far this season. Travis has thrown the ball a little bit better than Kendall. And uh, it's very tight. And there's a very strong possibility that you'll see uh, Kendall in the game this week as well. And you know, so it's not a, it's still not a, you know, what I term a two quarterback system. Some people say, well, you're playing two quarterbacks, so it's a two quarterback system. No, it's not as far as my definition where both guys know they're going to play X amount of time or X amount of uh, plays or whatever the case may be. It's we're waiting for some separation to occur. You know, ideally we'd like some separation to occur and, and one guy to take charge and settle in and be the guy. But uh, that hasn't happened yet, so they're both going to continue to get opportunities until that does happen. We're, we're winning with strong defense, a sound kicking game, and a strong running game. That's what we're winning with right now. Got to throw the ball better. We know that. We all know that. And we got to catch the ball better. We got to protect better. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that go into that. So with that running game going uh, like it's going and the defense going like it's going, is there a thought to ramp the tempo down and win games with running and defense? we got to do whatever we think is right for that particular week. Um, and that's certainly, you know, one of the, one of the uh, factors that we control as far as is tempo. And, and so we'll make that determination as we go through the week what the best, uh, which tempo gives us the best chance to win. And we've been... Uh, you know, fast early in the season, then we went to the, uh, a situation where we slowed the tempo down until we got the first first down, and then at UCLA in the second half we slowed it down mostly the entire half. And so we just got to do whatever we feel will give us the best chance to win, and that that uh, you know that's what we'll do is just is adjust the tempo accordingly to as per that. And as far as the best chance to win this weekend coming up against USC, this is a huge game with them and you guys having the same amount of conference loss is a huge mm -hmm. game as far as the conference south race is concerned. Will you speak to the magnitude of this game and exactly what it means for your program? Counts as one, just like any other one. I'm, not a, I'm never going to get into the drama game of building up a game and making it a life or death situation. That's not how we operate. It's every game's important, and uh, this one is no different. And then whatever the five after that will be no different from this one. And so it's, it's a matter of trying to play well every week. And, uh, yeah, SC is in first place right now. There's no doubt about that. And so that's, uh, you know, that's a challenge for our guys. But as far as build up for a game and, and treating games differently, that's, that's not how we operate. How frustrating have all the drop passes been? And do you have a reason or, you know, any, any number of reasons for those drop passes? No reason that uh, <clears throat> we can put our finger on, and, and yeah, it's been uh, uh, frustrating for us. Now, you know, you look at every game, anybody playing any week, and there's going to be a few drops. We've just had a few too many. And so it's not like you're going to go through games with zero drops. That happens very seldom. But uh, we certainly have had uh, more than our share. And, uh, but again, it's not just that. You know, we've got to put the ball in better spots sometimes. We've got to pass protect better sometimes. We've got to call better plays sometimes. And so, so it's a combination of things. And, and we're not pointing the finger at any one guy, any one group. Uh, if everywhere are pointing the finger at me, you know, I'm the guy that's got to try to get it solved. Tommy, welcome. They brought, they brought a punt. We brought a punter to the press conference. You know, I probably have lots of questions. Okay. Kyle, during the course of a game, what is the decision-making process among you and Aaron and Dave of switching quarterbacks? And then overall, how far away from what you would describe as adequate quarterback play are you? Well, we go by just how we're functioning offensively, how efficient we're, we're being, how, how we're moving the chains. Uh, are we protecting the football? Are we turning it over? That was a big reason why. Uh, we made the change at halftime in this last game as we had a couple turnovers and I think 80 yards of offense and just a couple field, field goals to show for our efforts. And so we're just, anytime we think that making a change is going to give us a spark, then that's when we'll do it. And I guess that's the, the most simplistic way I can explain it is when we need a spark and we're looking for a spark and we're not getting the production we need, then we look at making a, a change. Do you need to monitor Booker's amount of work, whether it be in practice or in the games? I think yes, 
um, particularly during the work week, you know, the practice of Monday through Friday. And, and uh, this time of the year, you do very little contact. There's not any live work going on with the, with the travel squad. And so, but uh, you need to make sure that uh, you don't give, you don't overwork him Monday through Friday. Then on Saturday, you know, he's proven he's capable of a 30 plus carry game, but, but uh, I don't think you want to do that every single week. But uh, he's certainly proven to be thus far very durable and, and uh, get stronger as the game goes on. Uh, it was announced today that there'll be another late start in uh, Tempe. Have you ever, do you recall having uh, four in a row this late? And, and what are your feelings about the later games versus earlier? Uh, I didn't know that about the, the, the next one, but uh, they're, you know, everything's driven by TV and the, the TV schedules. And, and we really don't concern ourselves with it because we have no control over it. Ideally, you know, we'd like to kick off at noon every week. I mean, that, I think that's ideal, but that's never going to happen. And so you just deal with the, the hand that you're dealt. And uh, we have a good, we think we have a good uh, protocol or, or, or system for, for whenever the kickoff is based on how we structure the day. And so, so we just go with that and, and uh, we're used to it. And so it's nothing new to us. Uh, you also have Kenneth Scott back as a starter this week. Is there a thought process there why he beats out Tim Patrick this week? Well, he, he blocked exceptionally well, and blocking is a big part of uh, being a complete receiver. And uh, really, they're all three going to play between Drez, Timmy, and, and Kenneth Scott. They're all going to play, and, and naming Kenneth the starter this week is really probably probably a product of uh, the blocking situation. But but uh, Timmy was not disappointing. It's just a matter of the Kenny uh, had a pretty good game in that regard, and, and uh, they're all three going to play. So really, we could have listed either guy as the starter. They're going to play most likely equal amount of time. Kyle, uh, Kessler had a record-setting performance against Colorado. And then, uh, Tev, uh, I guess, can you talk about Tevin Carter's situation, if he'll be back this week? And yeah. the secondary, the challenge they face with Kessler coming off that performance. Yeah, Kessler's playing very well. He's uh, in the top ten in the nation in pass efficiency, uh, taking care of the football. He's only thrown one interception in, in – uh, 200 and whatever attempts he's had, he stole the ball a bunch and just the one interception. And uh, coming off a great performance against Colorado, as you mentioned. And so we've got a, you know, we've got a work cut out for him. He's a lot like uh, Halliday as far as a pocket passer in Mannion that we just faced and doesn't, uh, not real eager to run the ball. Not to say he's not a good athlete because he is, but he makes his living in the pocket. And uh, he's done a nice job of that this year. Uh, Tevin Carter, I'm going to say again, we hope he plays. It's unknown. And, uh, we're just, uh, it's a week to week thing. And we sure missed him last week, but you know, you're always gonna miss a good football player. That's just how the game goes. There's no excuses. There's no, nothing you can do about it. So we just move on, but hopefully he'll play, but I can't tell you for certain one way or the other. <clears throat> Did you ask for any clarification on the, uh, the I guess, rule to drop pass by Drez in the end zone? No, did not, I, you know, you can send stuff in and and uh, I don't know what, what good that does. It, the, what, I, I still don't understand the rule, and I don't know that anybody does. You know, it, he, so well, he took two steps, and then the ball was not the, compl the catch was not completed. Well, what if he took four steps? And well, what if he took six steps? I mean, I don't know where the cutoff is. And so, um, short short answer: No, didn't get didn't ask for clarification beyond what I was given at the game. When you look at uh, USC's defense, why did Boston College run the ball so well on them, and can that be replicated? Well, they had a, a good scheme going in, a lot of uh, uh, two tight one back uh, formations, and ran the power play, and the Q kept the ball uh, on the zone read a few times, and you know one time it busted off. I think it was about an eighty yard run, and so um, it was just one of those nights where where Boston College got the running game cranked up, and yeah, every, everyone that plays SC, I'm sure, has looked at that game and tried to figure out if they can <laughs> duplicate that because they had like 400 and something yards rushing. But but uh, it was one of those nights where they were blocking up the run game exceptionally well and and SC was not defending the run game very well that night. There's no There was no secret plays or, or anything unique they were doing other than just playing smash mouth football and they did a good job of it. With Jac Jacoby Hill getting some playing time last week and now being listed as the backup, <clears throat> what do you see his role being going forward, and do you see him getting a lot of reps? We hope so. We hope he gets more than he got last week. He just got a handful last week, and it was his first live action and you know, since spring ball, since he, since he had the injury. And so uh, he's a talented player, and we hope to integrate him more and more each week as the season goes on. And, and hopefully he'll play uh, like, you know, uh, 
maybe a, a fourth of the game, a third of the game this week. It's hard to put a number on it, but we want to increase his his reps uh, in practice as well as in games. He's been a little bit limited in practice as well up to this point, but we're going to try to start adding to that as per his uh, if he feels good. You know, if he starts getting sore and, and we start going backwards a little bit with it, then we need to back off. But so far, it's been uh, really good to this point. You joked around about Tommy over there earlier, but you've been in three consecutive games where it's come down to it. Football's a game of inches. What mm -hmm. kind of a weapon do you have over there with a, a punter that can give you field position like that? Huge weapon. He's, uh, we are leading the nation in net punting right now, and that really is a, a big factor in field position, flipping the field with your punt team. I think he's knocked 18 of his kicks inside the 20, and... 12 of those or so inside the 10. and So it's, it's been a big plus for our team and, and special teams all the way around. Tommy's doing a great job. The, the coverage people around him are doing a great job. The snappers, the, the place kickers, the returners. And so it's, it's a matter where, uh, a matter of everybody buying into what we're doing and, and surrounding our very exceptional skill people on the special teams with guys that uh, are really giving great effort. But it can't be, it can't be understated how, or overstated how valuable he's been to our team. Kyle, it's mid-season, and you've got, you can argue, five of the six teams in the South are still in it to win the right. division. Going back to even before, not just the Pac-12, but Mountain West and WAC and all that, can you recall being this late in the season with this many teams still having a shot to win it? Not off the top of my head, no. You know, I'd have to look back and research it. I'm sure it may have happened or come close to it somewhere along the line. But, but uh, and then you look at the North, and everybody's got more than one loss except for Oregon. And so it's uh, it's a unique situation where where uh, everybody's it's not surprising because going into the season we thought that it was pretty balanced league and everyone was going to beat each other up so I wouldn't say it's a surprise but uh, it certainly is uh, different from the norm it's a it's a departure from what's normal. Kyle, can you give a mid-season evaluation of your team? Mid-season, well, we're five and one, and you are who your record says you are, who and what your record says you are. So I think we're doing a pretty good job. Um, Certainly got things to work on. I mean, that's obvious. We're playing well in a lot of areas, and we got uh, uh, some deficiencies that, uh, that we're trying to address, which I don't know if there's any team in the country that can say, yeah, we're, we're playing well in every single facet of the game. But, but uh, I'd say being 5-1 and one through the first half of the year, we think we've positioned ourselves pretty good uh, for, the, for the second half of the season, and, and we just got to take them one game at a time and, and try to go 1-0 and every week. That's been our mentality so far this year, and that's got to continue. Has the identity of this offense changed? Uh, you know, obviously you've you've relied a lot more on the run. Uh, have you had sort of a, a, a moment where you've decided that we're, our tempo isn't going to be what we thought it was, and our offense is going to be quite what we thought it was coming into spring and fall? Well, I think it's constant adjustment as per you know how your where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and and I don't think we're playing right now in the last couple of weeks as fast as we envisioned early in the season. But like I said, you got to do whatever you got to do to to give yourself the best chance to win. And, and uh, that's a, a constant uh, state of, of adjustment and trying to determine you know, who's, who's your, you know, who is your strengths uh, individually, what are your strengths uh, position group wise, and just continually. That's why we coach. I mean, that's why you get paid to coach is to make those decisions along the way and strategize. And because tempo is definitely a strategy. I mean, you know, tempo, fast tempo, slow tempo. That's definitely plays into the equation. And and uh, you know, it's so to answer your question. You know, we're probably much more of a run game than I thought we'd be. Uh, a strong running team than I thought we'd be. Uh, and we haven't run as up tempo as we thought we'd be going into the season at this point in time. Leonard Williams uh, up front, you know, what does <clears throat> does he bring in terms of his ability? A lot of people think he's going to be a top five pick next yeah, year. I would have to agree with that. He's, uh, you know, from the tape I've seen, he's a disruptor. Uh, he's a guy that demands double teams. And uh, he's, he, he's uh, a very talented uh, football player and one of the best defensive linemen, maybe the best defensive lineman in the country. And so we, we definitely have our hands full with him. And it'll be a challenge to, uh, to make sure we try to uh, – somehow get him uh, slowed down a little bit. Is that your wife, Dirk, or what's going I on? I wish. Yeah. Pizza. Pizza. <laughs> hey, Kyle, uh, now I'm all distracted. No. Yeah. Talking about the running back matchup between Allen and Booker, you got the two top running backs uh, mm -hmm. yardage-wise. Uh, how pivotal is that in this game? It'd be very pivotal, and that's, uh, as I say, just about every week, not every single week, but that football 
most weeks comes down to stopping the run and being able to run. And uh, we got two teams that are doing a nice job. I think we're rushing for more yards a week than they are. I think they're about 190, and we're somewhere just over 200. But two strong running teams. They're very balanced on offense. They're doing a great job throwing the football with Kessler, as we talked about. And Allen is uh, a terrific back. We've got our own back that we're very high on, uh, Devontae Booker. And, and so that'll be an intriguing matchup. That'll be a big uh, determiner in the game as to how those two guys fare versus yeah. the, respected, the respective uh, defenses. And last question, how different is USC under Sarkeesian than Kiffin? Uh, not markedly different. I mean, you know, they, they've, they've spent a lot of time together, Kiffin and, and Sarkeesian, on, uh, on the SC staff prior. And, and uh, I think they both have the same basic philosophies and, and uh, ideas, uh, particularly offensively. And so uh, not, uh, not a huge difference, but uh, there are some differences. Kyle, to get back to the midseason question, are you surprised you're five and one at midseason, given the fact that you've scored five offensive touchdowns in the last four games? Well, not not surprised. Um, like I said, when you're playing a high level of defense and strong special teams, that's two thirds of the phases right there. And and when you're running the football effectively, like we are, you know, 250 rush yards is much more valuable than 250 pass yards. It is. I mean, just statistically, if you look it up, that's going to have more of an impact. And so. Uh, that's something that we've been able to, I don't want to say mask, but uh, supplement you know, offense with, with the rushing yardage. With the, with the lack of throw yards we have, we've been able to make that up with, with some more rushing yardage. You said uh, every game is as important as the next one. And lots of coaches say that. And that was probably a little hard for you to sell with the way the BYU Air Force and TCU rivalries developed in the Mountain West. But are you new enough in this league? And this league, a lot of people point for USC. Do you think you're new enough in this league? You haven't really built rivalries to the point that we saw with some of the other teams in the past? I'd say without a doubt. You know, we're only our fourth year in. It takes, you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 years, uh, you know, to, to get those rivalries uh, really developed. <clears throat> now, some happen quicker than that. You know, something may happen in a certain game where there's bad blood right out of the gate and all of a sudden – there's a rivalry that's uh, that's born, but but I think that you know when you talk about how long we were in the other conferences relative to how long we've been in this conference, I think that, that we're not yet at that point with the rivalry games in this league. You really uh, like to make a little theater out of those helmet reveals, don't you? That's not my idea. Where's is Freddie in here? <laughs> Freddie, that's Freddie's our theatrical guy, and so he's, and it's all about, and it's it's a positive because it's all about uh, recruiting and getting our recruits information about us and letting them have some insight as to what we're all about and and uh, the personality of our team and so forth, and so that really is what the driving force is. Plus, our players really like it. I mean, they it's good to uh, to uh, lighten things up on occasion, and so I think we've got a, a pretty good pop from those uh, those deals. And Maddie, Maddie back there, yeah. Along those lines of recruiting, how big of a role can a game like this play, especially in the region of Southern California? Well, it's it's uh, winning in general it boosts recruiting. I mean, that's if you were to say and pinpoint the most important factor in recruiting for most schools, it's it's winning and and play you know, recruits and and the players out there that are looking at your program. That's that's a big that's a big deal as it should be. Um, USC is obviously right in the footprint of our Southern California areas, and and uh, it'll it'll have an impact there. But I don't I don't care who you are uh, across the country, what program you are. It's tough to go into USC's backyard and take a player out of there that they really want. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And so, even though it's important, I'm not sure it's important for our battles against the Trojans as much as our battles with some of the other conference teams in the same footprint in the same area.